so my name is uh, Marina Keda. I'm Jean Monet Fellow at the European University Institute. And um, uh, today uh, I'm really, I, uh, it's a real pleasure for me, it's a real honor for me to launch, uh, to kick off this new academic year series of seminars on migration studies. Uh, generally, Migration Policy Center conducts uh, uh, research on uh, transnational governance of uh, international migration, displacement, uh, mobility as Salim and so today I am uh, um, delighted to welcome um, John Carlo uh, with the presentation Pathways to Permanence and Immigration Levels, Struggles and Limits to Societal Membership for Migrants Amidst COVID-19 in Canada. Uh, John Carlo is a senior research associate um, under the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration Program at Toronto Metropolitan University, Canada. So, John, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Marina. Uh, I guess I'll just jump right in uh, to the, the talk today. Um, I guess as an opening slide, really, uh, this is some images of some of the politics of migration in Canada over the last few years, uh, whether it be uh, protests in the street by migrant rights organizations, um, the rise of a, a farther right party looking to, to reduce immigration levels in Canada, and, and try to um, capitalize on some of the, the COVID-19 misinformation in politics, uh, as well as our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and a former immigration minister, uh, Marco Mendicino. Um, as I start, though, I'd like to acknowledge the research assistance of Kushan Azada. I'm a research assistant at the CERC in Migration and Integration. And of course, I'd like to thank the MPC and the Schumann Center for hosting my talk today, um, Andrew, Martin, um, uh, Mar Marita and Valentina have been very welcoming and I really appreciate the way you've all let me kind of integrate into the activities of the center in my short stay and, and let me come of course. So for my talk today I want to just quickly touch on some of the Canadian broader context that might help frame the paper for those who aren't as familiar with, with Canada. Um, talk a bit about the project and methodology that I've been looking at. And for this paper, I was particularly looking at the politics of questions of access to permanent residence in Canada, which is kind of the step that people um, get to before full citizenship, but it gets them most of the political and social rights that, that Canadians enjoy. And I'm looking at this through the window of the concept of migration battlegrounds, and so I'm kind of going to look a little bit from the center, then left to right, on who are the different actors contesting these questions and their significance um, before concluding. So just the context of migration and belonging in Canada, um, you know, contrary to the European states, it's a settler colonial state where Canada continues to have hierarchical relationships amongst primarily European settlers and their descendants, migrants and immigrants and indigenous peoples. And so migrants who come into that context, you know, may come in as a permanent status or um, under migrant worker programs, but there are a number of kind of tiers to Canadian citizenship that should be kept in mind. But the overall common sense of Canadian politics at the centre tends to be relatively pro-immigration. If you look at the, the table at the bottom that I, I borrowed from some of my colleagues at CERC, um, most people actually would disagree that there is too much immigration to Canada as of 2021. That was 70%. So the kind of common sense idea of Canada and migration is relatively uh, welcoming in general terms. But the Canadian immigration model has really shifted over time from one that was primarily granting permanent residence upon arrival to those that come to Canada. And over the last decades, it's one that Goldring and Landolt have kind of called the shoots and ladders model, where there's many ways if you come to Canada as a migrant to fall 
in and out of of proper immigration status if you want to put it that way and at the in the <laughs> excuse me in the current context there is a growing far right in canadian politics that's making more of an impact discursively and canada to the surprise of some has actually been exporting a fair number of far right personalities and seeing our our far right media consumed um, by others and so just a sense of this changing immigration model I wanted to share is just looking at the trajectory here, this yellow line from this, or maybe green. Uh, anyway, the different bright colored line you can see there is really the growth in temporary migration to Canada, uh, which you can really take um, in comparison to the, the blue lines on the bottom of the amount of permanent residents. So we've really seen a change to our immigration and settlement model. And this is a slide I've borrowed from Andrew Griffith. He's a former director general of Canadian citizenship and multiculturalism, who's constantly communicating pretty well with our immigration department to update these numbers that aren't always readily available. And so this is part of a larger project I've undertaken um, called Contestations of Migration and Belonging, really trying to look at the, the current state of migration narratives and politics in Canada, particularly amidst emerging from COVID. Um, some of the key, the ideas and the methodology, um, so there definitely there's some Italian influence from Maurizio Ambrosini's idea of the immigration and um, battleground. And then the main, the main methodology I've been using is critical policy discourse analysis, which is really um, critical discourse analysis, its contribution to policy studies. And I've looked at both broader themes of migration and belonging, but also policy specific discourses, as I outline in the paper. And and we've collected a lot of sources use and looked at them within Vivo software. And from this paper, again, the focus is really on immigration levels and pathways to permanent residence and citizenship, looking at materials that I collected with my research assistant really from the start of the pandemic in Canada to the end of 2022. So the actors, this is a dense slide. Oh, actually, the, so the overall argument actually before that next slide is really that for a number of reasons, whether pragmatic or their own convictions, that most actors in the Canadian context express support for significant immigration levels, for diversity, and these notions of pathways to permanent residence. So one might hope that this really has meant a political opening for those concerned with migrant rights in Canada. Um, but that opportunity is perhaps to enact more inclusive policies is perhaps being missed. There's significant struggles over the terms of membership in Canada offered to those arriving or already present without full citizenship or permanent residence. And, and that's really seen, for example, with contestations over whether Canada would have a regularization program of some scope um, or not. And while many actors are employing similar languages and talking about pathways to permanent residence, um, the substance of their arguments and policy positions are actually quite different and need to be carefully scrutinized. And I also wanted to add that Canada may see a new government in the couple of years, so there may be more reason uh, for these things to be in flux. So this dense slide is really is kind of a summary slide of, of which actors and the type of documents I looked at. I'm not going to spend a lot of it of time on this, but really actors from the political center were more looking at the Liberal Party and actual Canadian government. Uh, then looking at umbrella groups such as the Canadian business community, their Chamber of Commerce or the Business Council of Canada, uh, looking at actors that I would say are representative all, as well from left or pro uh, migrant rights civil society. Um, and a lot of these organizations I looked at were umbrella groups to try to capture the views of a larger constituency. Uh, we also looked at press releases from the Bloc Québécois, um, the Quebec-based Sovereignist Party in Canada, and then from the far right, the sample was really the People's Party of Canada and, and Rebel Media, as I believe I mentioned. 
So, so to start with this, this panorama of migration and belonging in Canada and what were the developments kind of pre-pandemic and how have they shifted, um, I've tried to, I actually found a document I thought was very useful as a kind of a pre-pandemic baseline. And this is the immigration levels plan announcement by Canada in March of 2020. Uh, literally days before the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic became evident in Canada. And so this was the discourse of the immigration uh, minister announcing relatively ambitious plans. And so arguing the Canadian immigration system is one to benefit all Canadians, you know, strengthen the middle class, unite families, build inclusive communities, and of course, to helping Canadian business create middle class jobs and the economy, and also some nods to its humanitarian obligations. So I thought this captured very well, kind of the center common sense of Canadian immigration policy and a number of the, the areas that it wishes to nod to. And I think it's notable that in this announcement, there was really no talk, for example, of regularization programs, um, but more this, this pre-pandemic discourse. And so in the Canadian context, um, there have been increasing permanent resident levels in Canada and on a relatively consistent basis, and these have been pretty widely endorsed. So you can see in the chart on the left, kind of by year, the Canadian population and the number of permanent residents admitted to Canada. So Canada is even planning to accept 500,000 new permanent residents to Canada by 2025. And these types of plans tend to be welcomed by business, but also by the labor movement in Canada. Um, as you can see from this image where Canada's unions have tended to welcome increased federal immigration targets. So there's not a huge anti-immigrant constituency here, but as I, I pointed out in the earlier slide, these numbers of permanent residents admitted are, are really pale now in comparison to the number of temporary migrants coming into the can to Canada, many of whom of course want to stay long-term. And so within the pandemic, um, as I think was the case in many countries, the contributions of precarious status migrants and immigrants were really, um, were really visible in a way they perhaps were not previously. And so um, I think amidst the pandemic, we saw some both some openings and some closures to, to more welcoming policies in the center of Canadian political discourse, again, using the Liberal Party as as a bit of a barometer. And so to look at this, I looked at the, the pandemic um, period mandate letters. So the Canadian Prime Minister will typically, and this is the first government I believe was published these letters of instructions to ministers of what their priorities are. And so we saw a mix of exclusionary policies, but also potential openings that can be fought. So in terms of continuities and perhaps a trajectory of exclusion to asylum seekers, uh, we saw a mandate to strengthen the Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement to prevent asylum seekers from crossing into Canada. And this is a policy the government has implemented. We also saw the, that the mandate that the government was to pursue kind of trusted employer programs and perhaps expand migrant worker programs. And that's as well, the government has implemented this. And so the areas that seem to be the 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 openings to perhaps widen, um, that the government in its mandate letter talked about expanding pathways to permanent residence for international students or migrant workers. Um, and as well, they also mentioned a pertemp potentially having a regularization program for those without status or who are undocumented. But interest in comparison to those other policy priorities of business, and perhaps international relations, these more these pro-migrant reforms have yet to be implemented or, or have any clear picture of, of what they're going to be. And so the discursive opening here, and again, I'm drawing on a press release from the immigration minister because it's quite typical of some of the rhetoric used. Um, so the government did announce in 2021 um, a pathways program for 
what they said were 50,000 migrant workers and 40,000 international students. And so this shift in discourse from the, the prior immigration levels announcement I've given you said, you know, here we've come to appreciate the meaning of the word essential. Uh, the government referred to the contributions of our frontline workers as the, our guardian angels and saviors, and even invokes the idea that there should be a generational change in the nature of Canadian immigration policy, uh, really to recognize the contributions of migrants and immigrants, and that this should be reflected in wider policy. So it's, it's hard to imagine a, a much greater discursive opening in terms of policies that could have been implemented. Um, but in practice, though, the, these pandemic pathways, programs, and practices have tend to be quite modest. Uh, in May 2020, they announced a very tiny agricultural worker pilot project. So there are people who come to Canada as migrant workers in agriculture literally for decades with no access to permanent residence. And so the government created a very small uh, pilot for perhaps uh, you know, under 3,000 workers and family members a year. The government also, with this guardian angels uh, discourse, granted um, permanent residence to some uh, failed refugee claimants or those with pending claims. But this was under 9,000 people, you know, more than a year after the program was announced. And then the TR to PR pathway, it's worth noting, you know, 50,000 of those were essential workers, but most of them or close to half was actually international uh, graduates. So in comparison to the discourse of generational change, uh, the actual policies of pathways were quite modest. And so, so I've, I've talked a lot about government discourses and some of the policies. The way this has been contested or what policies have promoted from, from other parts of the political spectrum I think are notable and which were well received. So if we look from business, um, business groups actually were in were releasing their own kind of model mandate letters to the minister, kind of to parallel that which the prime minister issued, and and key demands by the Chamber of Commerce, one of the largest business umbrella groups in Canada, was around again this modernization of the temporary foreign worker program with a focus on a trusted employers program, which would grant easier access to migrant labor, and but interestingly they did talk talk about expanding pathways to permanent residence for migrant workers and students. But in terms of policy, what was implemented really seems to be in the, the realm of more migrant labor. So how has this been contested from the left of, of the political spectrum in Canada? Um, from migrant rights organizations, I drew on a statement here from the Migrant Rights Network, a very large umbrella group of migrant labor uh, of migrant workers and their allies. And so they made a statement on the International Day to Combat Racism and Discrimination in March of 2022. And in that, in their statement, they diagnosed the lack of secure immigration status as really key in the lacks of rights and services received or the inability to reunite families and the disproportionate impacts of, of COVID-19 on migrant workers, which led to illness and even death in some sectors. They had a critique of the guardian angels and that TR to PR pathway I'd mentioned as excluding the majority of racialized and low-waged migrants and that there haven't really been these permanent changes that might reflect the, that um, talk of generational change by the immigration minister. And, and they point to the size of the type of coalition that they've been trying to build in invoking that migrant led organizations as well as 400 civil society organizations allied to them are calling for full and permanent immigration status for migrants in the country. So on the most uh, ambitious of plans, um, there is a fair bit of support in civil society and they, they had a critique of the federal budget of, of 2022 in Canada that was endorsing trusted employee trusted employers um, as a dominant approach as problematic and exploitative um, because of the amount of, of power that could that could place in the hands of employers.
And so as for organized labor, it seems to be following the, the lead of migrant rights organizations, um, including Unifor, which is Canada's largest private sector union, is actually a member of the Migrant Rights Network, and the Canadian Labor Congress, a large umbrella organization itself, has called for pathways to permanent residency for all migrant workers. Uh, and again, there's this consensus around immigration levels. Um, now, when it comes to immigration levels, as I've tried to mention, Canadian immigration levels don't reflect all newcomers to, to Canada, that really there's the, those who are coming as permanent residents or maybe are transitioning versus on the same time, those joining Canadian society can also come in with a temporary status. And so in Parliament, uh, the, the New Democratic Party, really Canada's Social Democratic Party, is really arguing that the, the Liberal government is, is in some ways really favoring um, abuse and exploitation by allowing for this continued reliance on migrant labor, rather than having permanent immigration levels that would incorporate really everyone joining the Canadian um, social formation in this way. And, and so they're arguing this, this model of temporary migration um, is problematic and that permanent immigration levels actually need to also incorporate migrant workers. And they also were calling for an ambitious um, regularization campaign. In Canada, the estimates can vary, but a lot of people would say at a minimum, there are probably 500,000 people um, in Canada without uh, a suitable, without a secure immigration status at the very least. Yeah. And so they're echoing social movement demands for, for PR on arrival, really. So to shift then now, lastly, to the political party right in Canada, the largest opposition party in Canada is the Conservative Party. They were in office in Canada from 2006 to 2015. And they, they have a bit of a balancing act um, in some ways with dynamics around the People's Party of Canada. Um, they're, they're likely at this stage looking to probably be Canada's next government. If, you, if the election were held today, uh, this is one website in Canada that kind of um, collects polls and, and puts out odds of the outcome, but are really that the odds are in favor of a conservative majority or if not a minority government. And there's just a selfish plug of an article I wrote earlier on their approach while in power if, to try to get a sense of what they might be up to if they win. And so the conservative platform in 2021, I think is, is worth looking at for this question of pathways and access to permanent residence. Um, there was um, an attempt by the Conservatives to really shift to the political center under their former le leader, Aaron O'Toole. And so he's arguing, and then their platform, even on the right of the political spectrum, it said the Conservatives would create pathways to permanence for those in Canada. But they also want a path to permanence that uh, relies on employee sponsorship of applicants for permanent residency. So you see there is some uh, pro-employer dynamics there. And there's some pressure from the political right in Canada uh, with the rise of the People's Party of Canada. Some estimates, and they're a relatively new party in Canada that was founded by um, the second place finisher in a prior leadership contest, but he's really in, adopted a lot of far right talking points. And so he's using, this is Maxime Bernier in the photo. They're employing discourses of mass immigration, um, that the, the society and its cultural is under threat. Um, discourses that are not actually that common in Canadian politics, um, but they won 4.9% of the vote in the 2019 election. And some have estimate, estimated that they probably cost the Conservative Party of Canada, who those voters probably would have normally voted for, for up to 24 seats. So that could have even cost them power. So the way the Conservative Party has tried to reintegrate some of those actors or voters for the People's Party 
um, into their own support, has been really embracing some of the conspiracy theories that became prominent amidst the COVID pandemic and endorsing the um, the convoy movement in Canada to a significant extent or discourses around um, not sending ministers to the World Economic Forum. And, but unfortunately, those World Economic Forum discourses, you know, also reside in the same um, neighborhood as, say, great replacement theory and those types of conspiracies. And so, but the new leader's approach in some ways has echoed that of Aaron O'Toole um, around an employer-driven economic um, immigration program where employers play a major role. But he's balancing a number of things. So he's refused, for example, to say what immigration levels the Conservatives might adapt. Um, he joined calls to, to close the Roxham Road border crossing, but with more inflammatory rhetoric than the government who executed it did. And then um, also is, seems to be courting some of the sovereigntist movement in Quebec with some of their, their votes in parliament around motions raised uh, by the Quebec separatist party. And so I would say in terms of the, the political right in Canada, then we see from the People's Party or rebel media who I couldn't discuss more of a far right project of more extreme unbelonging, but more from the Conservative Party, a selective belonging. Because as you can see, for example, in this, this tweet by Pierre Polyev, there's an effort to invite um, immigrants to adopt somewhat of a conservative imaginary um, in terms of, of their economic interests and ideas. Um, but there's some concern that they may engage in discourses and policies that would try to hold on to those People's Party of Canada voters. So I think to conclude then, and I know I'm at the end of my time, um, there's really, there's some boundary construction and contestation around migration and belonging in Canada where the details are really going to matter. So there's discrete, discursive agreement and a real opportunity amongst most of the, the political spectrum around access to permanent residence, at least a minimum of pathways. And there is a lot of agreement around the benefits of diversity and immigration. Um, but the points of contention really are there going to be very limited pathways for some or a more expansive immigration or regularization program, for example, what should be the role of employers in terms of controlling access to permanent residents, will there be a regularization program, what size and scope, and there's a fair bit of uncertainty now that it looks like we're likely to have a change in government. So lastly, about, you know, to conclude, I will say there's been this kind of ubiquity of, of pathways discourses in Canada that would indicate a potential political opening for inclusive policies, but the policy developments have not really matched that. And really the, the overall trajectory seems somewhat consistent in terms of the expansion of migrant workers. And this pathways discourse does seem to allow actors with very different political agendas uh, to signal their support for migrants and immigrants, but their overall policies prescriptions are still quite different. And so in the context of Canada's migration battleground, these discourses and policies uh, will still continue to have a lot of significance and, and contestation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, John. <laughs> Thank you for your really insighting and rich with information presentation. And now let us open the round of questions, comments, and discussions. And I would like to suggest maybe uh, one, two questions for John to respond. And if we will have many questions, uh, then we will collect them. And uh, I also invite our participants uh, online to join our discussion, to join uh, our um, question round. And you can uh, make it uh, using your hand option or just writing in chat so you're welcome who would like to start uh, Andrew you're welcome thanks John it's a really great really interesting paper I'm not a big expert on Canada so I've learned a lot from reading this I just wanted to go back to the first idea that you one of the first ideas you raised when you referred to immigration in Canada as a contested battleground and you referred to work of Marie Tambrosini, who, as a plug for the MPC, will be here in November to give a talk. 
But I wonder to and then, but what I don't see is really much evidence of a contested battleground. Uh, what and so I, I wondered rather, in a sense, what you have is some maybe a relation. It seems quite a consensual system with some, maybe some changes. But I was, but it, it was really to try and understand how we might conceptualize this in the sense of politicization of immigration in Canada and the extent to which politicization is occurring. And so a contested battleground could be an outcome of a politicization process. But the, and, and so it occurred to me, but are, are you saying there's been kind of been an expansion of the scope of conflict around immigration in Canada, which could be seen as indicative of the politicization of the issue? Uh, and then I thought, well, actually, there are things that you could include which could allow us to see that. So for instance, do we see increased public issue salience? So as the issue, because in a lot of work we've done on attitudes to migration, we've seen that salience, so attitudes, so everybody can have general favorability towards migration, but change in issue salience can have quite powerful political effect. Do you, so do you see change in issue salience? And also, I suppose you have identified and I go to the literature on politicization, you can see this is, partisan entrepreneurs but your partisan entrepreneurs seem to be quite marginal uh, but so it was really to maybe suggest that instead of talking about a contested battleground as your opening really what you're interested in is politicization the scope for the, 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 the expansion of conflict within the political system and the, the contestation could be one of the outcomes rather than the frame if you see what I mean and and to look and to look at that actually there is some very good work done on politicization here by some scholars here so if you if you're familiar with the work of say hans peter creasy on the politicization of european integration you might find that quite useful uh, in terms of defining your your own work thank you okay would you like to respond immediately or shall we collect one more question yes okay okay yes yes sure Okay, um, maybe let us keep turn. Uh, who wants to be next? Okay, Martin Kyovukam. And okay, who is the next in line? And uh, I, I would also suggest uh, to present yourself before putting the question. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin Roos, I'm based here at the Migration Policy Center. Yeah, so thank you. So, like Andrew, um, I mean, listening to this uh, sounds like a completely different world compared to European context. I mean, permanent immigration up, temporary immigration up, even the kind of what you presented as contested or controversial statements to me don't sound that controversial compared to what we hear in Europe. So I suppose one question, but like Andrew as well, is to explain why it hasn't you know, gone differently. Um, I mean, you can ask the question, why you know, have, has the debate developed as it has and why has have more cleavages in a way not not opened up. That would have been my my kind of initial question. And I wonder whether you can comment a little bit on, on what I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is kind of the starting point of a lot of immigration policy in Canada, which is which is an understanding that you grow the population through immigration. I mean that I know historically that's always been an aim, which has not been an aim in Europe. Uh, I mean, maybe it should be, but many European countries do not have such a starting point that it's a good thing to grow the population through immigration. And, and to what extent that kind of then trumps any other concerns that people might have, such as unions might have about uh, the rapid growth in, in, in temporary migration. So, so that's, and, and the second, second comment slash question is around, I mean, I know there have been some issues in Canada that have been debated about some problems. So for example, um, I mean, one reason, as you know, why permanent immigration programs are often um, um, critiqued, also in other countries in the UK, they, they kind of close it down, is because the people who get admitted don't find jobs, uh, because the job requirement is not strictly necessary in order to be admitted. And then in Canada, you often have kind of people doing jobs which don't respond to their skills. So that's the advantage of a temporary migration program, that the job requirement puts people into jobs. So to what extent is that still an issue? And, and and the second point is, I also know there have been debates about one one thing that comes up in Europe often with regard to temporary immigration programs is that we need such programs because we have sector specific shortages. So unless you're able to limit the employment of migrants in specific sectors, or in, in the case of Canada, in particular regions, right, you have regional shortages. So unless you can limit the, the kind of geographic or and sectoral employment of people, you're not going to be able to address the shortages because people might not want to work there. They'll go somewhere else. So I'm wondering if you can comment on on, on those two issues as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, maybe let us pick one more question from online uh, attendees. And uh, Doctor, uh, sorry. Hi. Good evening. 
I think it's it's evening in my place. Uh, I'm Dr. Tinder from uh, India. Basically, I'm a, from sociology background. So I just have one question that uh, recently there are so many changes are going on in Canada. Like uh, Trudeau is, uh, I'm not against of anything. I'm just say, asking that Trudeau, he's a favor of uh, so many Punjabis and he was giving so much uh, importance to Punjabi people or Indian immigrants. So uh, why it's going on? What is the reason behind that? Why uh, like in it's, it's, it's a huge migration from Punjab basically after COVID-19, most of the students, they are migrating to Canada and Canada opened their doors and they are accepting all the uh, students, even they are not uh, compatible for the education, even they have no proper uh, education qualification, still they are getting a place in Canada. So what what is the reason behind that? Why government is uh, so much uh, helping them to come to Canada? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John, would you reply? Sure, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, Andrew, thanks for the comments and definitely any any literature recommendations, I'd be super happy to, to collect and take a look at. Um, I think it's what I think I tried to convey, I think it's far interesting based on the first couple of questions is perhaps it doesn't appear as much of a battleground around migration and immigration. Um, but I think if you're getting the substance of questions of societal membership, I think it really is like there, it's a very fundamental debate about what will be the nature of inclusion of those we bring into Canadian society and, and what level of security they will have and what access they will have to permanent residence and citizenship. And what I, I was trying to convey that, you know, even though some of the actors they talk in very similar ways, but the fundamentals of their policies around questions of societal membership are in substance quite different. And so I probably maybe I, I needed to to say that a little bit more more clearly. Um, the the salience question is an interesting one. I think it's it's remained relatively low in salience like it's not a top immigration is not really a top concern about Canada there is a bit more concern being expressed lately about immigration levels and and migrant labor in Canada mostly around economic challenges especially relating to housing that the housing market has gotten very expensive in Canada so just more recently I would say even the last year there's been more discourse starting to to question immigration levels. Um, but the more aggressive questioning of that, of that really more comes from the far right, um, perhaps not surprisingly, um, in ways that the, the Conservative Party tries to kind of ignore as much as they, they can because they can um, lose a lot of political support and, and writings if they start to um, engage in anti-immigrant discourses. Um, and I think, Martin, you raised the question, why hasn't it gone differently in Canada? Um, you know, why has it have an anti-immigration -im narratives grown? Uh, I think the, the political system in Canada, uh, I mean, Canada really underwent a, a major change in source countries from especially the 1980s onwards. And so, um, a lot of ridings in Canada have significant immigrant populations. And so any party that wants to form a government cannot afford to just write off large numbers of voters. And I, the 2015 election, I seems to be the conservatives keep rehashing after every election since why they lost and they keep going back to their their discourses around barbaric cultural practices and exclusionary citizenship discourses in the 2015 election. So they, they do seem to have learned some lessons politically from trying to increase perhaps the salience of immigration questions that it just did not go well for them. Um, and so I think the, the demographics of Canada, um, you know, really mean that those those votes matter and, and the number of ridings where those votes can be determinative of who wins, um, it, it really plays a major role in, in how parties conduct themselves. Um, so multiculturalism kind of is the, the central common sense of this. Um, I've tried to make sense of some of this 
because the differences do really matter. One way I've tried to look at it is as the liberal approach, one of more kind of neoliberal multiculturalism and the conservatives of practicing a more neoconservative version where they have to operate within that common sense, but they do try to kind of drag it to the right on their treatment, for example, of asylum seekers, uh, their citizenship discourses and things. Um, but it's very clear they, they know they can't drift too far from, from that common sense. Um, then the question of um, temporary programs for sector specific or geographically specific, um, I think that is something Canada has tried to do. I mean, we for decades and decades have had um, seasonal agricultural work programs, of course. Um, but the challenge there, it's one thing to justify that for some period of time. But when you have the same people coming back even decade after decade, then, you know, the question of your, your societal model of citizenship really comes into question. Um, in terms of the regional division, um, what we call provincial nominee programs have really grown in Canada. So the provincial governments are actually taking a much um, larger role in, in selecting immigrants to Canada and those who will be picked under the under the um, economic class of immigration. So there definitely are, are efforts to address those questions. The where the contestation is perhaps is um, you know, should not anyone who works for a long period of time have some access to, to permanent residence or not. Um, the region, the, the question around Really, it's, I don't think it's Trudeau. It's, I think it's the Canadian government and governments and universities and international students. Uh, the Canadian education system is, is largely now subsidized by international students. There are a lot of universities now where more than half their revenue comes from international students. So I don't think that's unique to Trudeau. Um, we have a, a real education industry um, that has arisen around extracting high international fees from international students. And so um, I think you mentioned, you kind of questioned the qualifications of some of the students. Um, I don't, I'm not as sure about things from that end, but the financial interest of Canadian institutions and some of these private colleges that have, have grown is to is to really extract that um, those funds from international students. So there really is a financial incentive. And as Canada's moved in more neoliberal directions where we don't support our education system, we're relying on vulnerable international students uh, to really subsidize our education system. OK, thank you, John. Let's go on. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, John, for an excellent review of the discourse about immigration in Canada, and, and you did a great job in presenting the political landscape. And I was particularly uh, struck, uh, I'm, I'm more interested in, in the outcomes of the policies, and I, I was particularly struck by one of your um, early quotes, the, the quote by the Minister of Immigration, Mendicino, who uh, said, insisted a lot on saying, we are creating middle-class jobs for immigrants. And, and he repeated that twice. Now I was simply wondering whether the regularization programs of the transition from uh, temporary to permanent residence permits really uh, prizes middle-class jobs. In other words, how much occupational educational selectivity there is in, 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 in new uh, permanent uh, resident permits, uh, which clashes, I mean, these claims clashes a bit with the idea, on the other hand, of uh, rewarding essential workers and uh, angel guardians or guardian angels of our well-being. So which of the two is true? Thank you. And one more question. Let us take online. Natalie Hodorowski, Fund for Global Human Rights. You're welcome. With your question. Hello, sorry, I'm just speaking to you from a, a cafe, so hopefully it's not too loud. But thank you, John, so much for your presentation. Um, I'm actually here, um, like, I'm actually a licensed lawyer from Ontario, but I live in Italy. Um, I have a quick question regarding uh, the time, the processing time 
four different applications. I'm wondering if this has played into, um, I wonder if this is just like uh, an issue left over from COVID, it's just slow or it's like been a, sort of an oversight of the liberal government to not address um, processing times for certain students. Thank you. Will you respond now? Sure. Um, so the first question, yeah, this discourse of middle class jobs, I think it actually relates a bit to what Martin was saying that that the government actually invokes immigration as more creating Canadian middle class jobs of supporting the larger Canadian economy. So that discourse is in significant extent actually directed to the Canadian public rather than than immigrants themselves, of um, unfortunately. So I don't know. Um, there, there's a lot of discourses kind of being balanced. Like that first um, quote I put up. You know, it talked about humanitarianism. It talked about um, economic growth. Um, it, it, it was about families. So there is a need or an attempt really to satisfy a lot of constituencies. And so I, there are contradictions, of course, in terms of, of whether the discourse um, is as pro, you know, migrant and immigrant as, as the government thinks, or um, within the pandemic, for example, there were discourses about we needed migrant workers to save the food system and to benefit food security. Um, and so those discourses, I think a lot of them are actually more about Canadian society, unfortunately, than it necessarily is the, the status of, of the migrants who are doing that work. And then as I tried to, to emphasize a bit, the, the discourses are just not matching the policies in terms of what our, our so-called, you know, our appreciation is supposed to be for people we refer to as, you know, guardian angels and, and essential workers. I think there are a lot of contradictions in the discourses versus the practice. Um, the question about processing times, am I, Natalie, I guess, is, is it the- Yeah, just like the backlog that I think has been kind of present over since the pandemic, sort of exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, I know, I guess like some streams, maybe like the Express Pathway stream may not experience this as much, but I know like from other- Natalie, Natalie, please. Yes. Uh, yeah, there were certainly, um, excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I mean, there are certainly my, there were certainly backlogs and continued backlog backlogs in programs. Um, but just, which is of course an issue, but I don't, but the, I think we're talking here a little bit more about the, the structural programs themselves. So of course there can be backlogs. Um, but uh, I don't know if it's the fundamental, you know, question driving these dynamics. It's not like the the more inclusive policies are there and the government just hasn't processed them yet. Um, so I think that's an important question, especially around questions of, of family reunification or access to permanent residence for a lot of people. Um, but I don't know that it's the fundamental structural issue, though it, it is an important um, one for sure. Thanks, John. Uh, great, great talk. Um, I was wondering whether you can expand a bit on the rise of uh, far-right parties and how they have affected, well, how they, this rise is reflected at the level of public opinion in Canada. And then just, just a very quick comment that made me, um, Andrew's comment made me, um, observation made me think about it, is that is the idea of politicization, I think, is still valid. You know, there is a rise, well, there is an array of uh, philosophers, of political philosophers who talk about the very core of politics and politicization is the, the idea of battlefield, of the division between enemies and friends. So I think in Canada, perhaps, I mean, the very fact that this battlefield is because it's politicized. Migration is politicized. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Luigi. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, <clears throat> hello, Martin Fink at the Schumann Center. Um, Thanks, John. Very interesting um, a question about the um, international political economy in the policy discourse. So 
something I read the other day that uh, Canada is apparently successful in uh, wooing H-1B visa holders from the US to Canada. Um, and these would be temporary workers. Uh, presumably they would come to Canada with the idea to move into a more permanent status. So that, that would be the logic of it, but maybe we don't see this back in your, in the statistics uh, yet. Um, did you find any um, evidence of this in your critical policy uh, discourse analysis that um, yeah, this sort of competitive element vis-a-vis -vis the US? Okay, thank you. And John, if you don't mind, let us add just one small uh, question from online. It is in chat. Uh, what is typical waiting time to proceed uh, to process applications? You're welcome. Oh, sorry. Sorry. The last, the first, the last of the questions was, "What is a typical waiting time for an immigration application?" I think there's just so many different categories that I don't want to say a particular time. I don't think there's a single time that I could provide that would really capture that. Um, for the the question of the far right in public opinion, I think in Canada that's that was very strongly influenced um, by the Trump administration. It really gave uh, a lot more permissiveness for far right discourses that previously people were quite shamed into not really expressing. Um, and then that's just accelerated over time. Um, some of it, the far right in Canada kind of keeps trying to jump on to particular issues to grow that constituency. So Islamophobia, when was one way of doing this, um, we had a motion in Canada condemning Islamophobia um, that the far right kind of said was an anti-free speech, was a free speech issue that they opposed. They also tried to jump on to discourses about the global politics, or sorry, the global compact for migration. And so we see in Canada, it's quite interesting, just the opportunistic nature. And the one that really seemed to help them was COVID-19 misinformation. And so there's just this kind of swamp of misinformation around, say, the World Economic Forum, um, immigration, um, you know, refugees, great replacement. So there's kind of this, this cesspool there um, that has seen some growing support. And I think that's what the People's Party of Canada really capitalized in the pandemic election when they received almost 5% support nationally, which um, was a pretty big surprise uh, to a lot of observers in Canada. Um, but it seemed like the perfect storm and, and mix of discourses. Um, so I would say that, the, yeah, the, those issues are quite important. Um, Islamophobia, unfortunately, it, there's been a lot of very tragic events. We had mosque shootings in Quebec, um, attacks on a family in London where most of the family was killed. Um, so Islamophobia has been a, a real problem in Canada. And then we kind of have political entrepreneurs in that space. Um, for financial gain. So Rebel Media, for example, is this far right website that's actually exported a lot of far right um, personalities like the founder of the Proud Boys was actually, you know, a Canadian far right personality. Um, and um, people like Lauren Southern or Faith Goldie. Uh, so we've kind of been contributing to that intellectual space, unfortunately, disproportionately. Um, I, the question you raise of the one of enemies and friends, I think is a very, is a actually a very apt question, because I think that's where the politicization in Canada. So people, parties need to be generally pro immigration, where their creativity is who they pick as the friends and enemies. So the conservatives will say they're largely pro immigration. But so they'll reserve their outrage for those they say are the Q jumpers or the bogus claimants, um, really refugee claimants. They'll put a lot of their energy 
um, into rejecting. And so within that overall kind of pro-immigration politics, in a way, um, the question is, who are the enemies? Who are the friends? And who are you inviting members of your political coalition to, to see as your enemies? So there's all of the, the discourses in favor of the hardworking immigrant. You should join our political uh, coalition and even discourses of the most offended people are the immigrants themselves. So there's really an attempt to build a common sense that in some ways incorporates some immigrants and migrants, but excludes others. Uh, so some of those debates has, has been a focus of my work on, on the Conservative Party. Um, and then, um, Martin, you mentioned the, the discourse around or war, kind of the the race for talent type of discourse. That is something the government, um, you know, has been has been very active in. And so there is, of course, that discourse uh, of economic advancement, and there are a lot of of policies there. Um, but I would say that fits a bit more into their overall, you know, discourse linking immigration um, to economic prosperity. But there certainly is a, quite a bit of that as well, of course. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, John. Some more questions? Uh, no, 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 any questions online as well? Oh, you're welcome, uh, Hirotaki, you're welcome. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm uh, Hiro, I knew Max Weber Perra at the uh, Schumann Center and NPC. I, uh, my background knowledge is quite limited in the context of the Canada immigration. So I'm not sure my question is relevant to your project itself, but uh, I have uh, two brief questions. It's a, uh, one is a, basically the time frame. I understand your analysis is basically uh, straight around the time of the COVID and after the COVID pandemic. And But I'm curious to know whether or how you can straight your analysis with a little bit more longer time span. I think it because the Liberal Party has been in power since 2015, 16. So I was wondering whether some like a similar uh, political discourse is happening around time and uh, how it's grow over the context of the COVID. And the second question is, I'm also curious to know about the, how the migrants themselves interact with the set of the actor you analyze. So, I assume there are some interaction between migrants themselves and some like a civil so organization, civil society organization, and how basically how active and how vocal they were. I mean, so yeah, these are the two questions. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Um, please be short because we have few time left. Yeah, the, the time frame, um, the reason I picked this time frame was amidst COVID, a lot of actors were, I think, more prominently as having clear policy statements around immigration than maybe is the case in, in, your, in your typical times. Plus, it, it seemed a, a rather remarkable period discursively in some ways. Um, in terms of the long-term relationship or how it represents the little, Liberal Party's trajectory. Um, I think it's fairly representative of some of the contradictions of the Liberal government's policies, where it does have very welcoming discourses. Some of its policies are, in fact, more welcoming than their predecessors. But the, the overall model still seems to be moving to one that particularly targets asylum seekers to, to reduce access to Canada, which is something that predated the pandemic. I think Canadian governments for many years, for example, had wanted to have the Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement apply across the entire border. And then the, the kind of neoliberal economic discourses were certainly there in the long term. And then second, Secondly, um, you know, migrants and the actors examined. I think the Migrant Rights Network very consciously tries to be migrant led. They part of their work is also Migrant Students United. So that's one actor where it really has tried to be uh, migrant led. And then the other actors, I think that really varies. But I think uh, so a lot of the other actors. Um, some of them are starting to take their cues more from migrants and immigrants, but others are more representative, I think, of particular stakeholders. And I'll leave it at that for time. 
Okay, thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for participation. But unfortunately, we do not have time left anymore. So, John, thank you very much. And everyone, have a nice day. Thank you.